Welcome, Catholicos, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, all who seek the truth. Today, it's a review, a review of a book by Giulia Meloni. That's the book, The St. Gallen Mafia. Or as it is already said before, Sankt Gallen Mafia. Uh, because this is the mafia which was based in Switzerland or had its uh, nice summer house in Switzerland where all the mafioso go and, uh, you know, the uh, go and uh, conspire amongst these, each other. And uh, some of you might not know what is the St. Gallen Mafia or Sankt Gallen Mafia. This is the mafia which was responsible to a great extent for the election of Jorge Mario Bergoglio now known as uh, Pope Francis. Uh, and is this, is, is this a conspiracy theory? Is this Sankt Gallen Mafia invented by anti-Francis traditionalists who hate the openness and the, the mercy of Jorge? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, this is a term, just like the conciliar church term, the conciliar church was actually brought up by member uh, representatives of the Vatican who were who went to uh, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and told him, you know, this is against the conciliar church. So they invented the term. Same thing, the Sankt Gallen Mafia here. I got to go into the camera. Uh, there's a video. I, I think I've made a couple of videos on the election of Pope Francis and reviews of some books. And I have a clip. Uh, or you can look it up on online, probably you'll find it. It's Cardinal Daniels of uh, Belgium, I believe. Uh, in it, he is the one who talks about the, this group of cardinals and bishops getting together in, Saint, in Switzerland, in St. Gallen, uh, where they basically conspired. He himself uses the term, he says, we were a club, we we're kind of like a mafia, a mafia. He's the one who brought it up a member of the mafia calling it a mafia um, and in it in this group of people they they were responsible they conspired in uh, basically trying to get they were anti-ratzinger so anti Pope benedict the 16th anti john paul ii and they wanted to change the church to make a new church and um, new church based upon the world which is acceptable to the world which is of course would be vomited out by Christ Jesus himself. Um, so in this book, it says exposing the secret reformist, more like deformist group within the church by Julia Maloney. And there's a forward by Timothy Gordon, and he has a YouTube channel, Timothy Gordon as well. Um, and um, so in it, in this book, it's actually, first of all, really well written. It's really kind of a um, fast-paced, uh, intriguing, very well. It's just uh, not bo not a boring read. Let's put it this way. Not a very technical and long. There's a ton of uh, links. Uh, it's all like online, so you can always double check the links, the her references easily. So you don't have to go searching for books and page of a book. There's immediately a link to an article or to uh, an interview or or whatever. You can always find it yourself. Anyways, so, uh, and this book, and it, why is it important? Well, the, the, this is a group of people. Well, there was uh, many questions. I have a book review. I can't remember who, who was the author of the election of Pope Francis and all the machinations that went into it and uh, the vote counting at the council and so forth. Um, then there's, anyways, there's a lot of questions. So how did we get Jorge as... Um, as Pope, as, as Bishop of Rome, as he prefers to be called. He, of course, removed the title of Vicar of Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, and uh, Supreme Pastor of Universal's Church. He relegated these terms as historical historical titles in, in the Vatican's yearbook. So he basically gave up these titles, Vicar of Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, um, Pastor of the Universal Church. He just prefers the word uh, bishop of Rome. And when he says Pope, he basically means just some moment of the Bishop of Rome. 
um, nothing more, I don't believe. Anyways, so in this book, The St. Colin Mafia, basically she just goes through the different characters of the mafia, the uh, their machinations, uh, who they are, what their ideas were, what did they do? Did they even actually push Benedict to resign? And as we know, Benedict uh, resigned the active exercise of the office, of the ministry. But he never actually resigned the papacy or the office, as Gonswine, his personal secretary, said in 2016 and republished in a 2020 book. Gonswine, the personal secretary of Benedict XVI, he said that Benedict XVI did not abandon the office of Peter, something which would have been impossible for him to do after his irrevocable acceptance of the office in 2005. That's what Gonswine says. And Benedict, in his, uh, I believe, last audience, uh, says that uh, his renunciation of the active exercise of the ministry did not revoke his acceptance of the office in 2005. Figure it out. See if it is uh, valid in this case. Anyways, that's not the topic of this book, of this video. So uh, it divides it into, as I said, different characters. So here's the four, uh, the kind of a so you have the table of contents, the next pope, Silvestrini, Martini, Casper, Janiels, the anti-pope, I mean the pre-pope, the pre fire, no country for old men, time, dark horse, the ghost of Cardinal Martini. And basically Martini was the, uh, the car bishop of Milan, patriar patriarch of Milan, another fake patriarchate, uh, god of surprises, um, Man Behind the Curtain, Chekhov's Gun, Things Fall Apart, Patience and Time, and Bibliography. So the foreword is written. So basically the foreword is written, uh, just before we go ahead, actually Martini is the, 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 the inspiration. Martini is the, is the patron saint of the Sankt Gallen Mafia, who wanted to put Martini as Pope. They wanted to, after John Paul II died, they wanted Martini as Pope instead of a Ratzinger. Um, actually, even before then, they wanted Martini, but Martini was getting old. So I will try to not, I highlighted a lot of this book, and I really don't want to kind of uh, drool on and on and on and coding, 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 and then uh, I don't want to like read the book to you. So I'm just trying to restrict myself. I know it's very hard for me to restrict myself on what to say and what to quote. Um, so anyways but as i said it's an excellent read easy read and not very long it's a hundred and let's see how many pages on that thing it's 180 pages not too bad hard bound nice published by tan publishing i believe let's see is it 10 or let's see who published this thing the song yeah 10 books all right so uh in the forward by uh Timothy Gordon, he says, he calls Martini, who called himself anti-pope, meaning pre-pope, the, the one who proceed, precedes the pope. Um, and Timothy Gordon says, Pope Francis's agenda is Cardinal Martini's agenda, the Sankt Gallen of agenda. And actually, when you read the book, you'll see what Martini um, uh, espoused and wanted in the new church. Um, and that's exactly what Francis is doing. And there's a quote, uh, uh, I should have put it up, but it, that doesn't, you can look it up yourself. I believe it was uh, recently when uh, uh, Jorge Francis uh, came out of the hospital, he had an operation. I believe that was the interview where he says, I'm not doing anything um, special. I am just doing what, I, what was agreed to by the Cardinals when I was elected. So basically, he's a servant boy. He is fulfilling his mission. Um, and I, 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 I believe it is was the interview when he left the hospital on Vatican News. Um, I guess he did two interviews very close to each other. But in one of them, Francis explicitly says he is just doing what the cardinals want him to do 
when he when they elected him. The South Carolina Mafia and their group, their ilk. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, anyways, so that there's a little intro by by Timothy Gordon, and then chapter one is war, um, and. Uh, France is actually just recently, I mean, when was it? What's today? I don't know. Uh, 7th of February or something. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, so he uh, did a, a tweet or an interview or something. I saw it on one of the Catholic websites. He was saying, my dream of the new church. He specifically wants a new church. That's why there is this so-called synodality thing happening these days a new church so he wants to alter the divine constitution of the church which jesus christ himself instituted um, so anyways so and when you read this book you will see basically everything martini wanted to do francis is attempting to perform to to to, um, to 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 fulfill and especially now recently with the german synod which basically is pushing <laughs> Uh, acceptance of, of uh, unnatural sexual acts as natural as normal and that the church's teaching is wrong which means God is wrong St. Paul is wrong all 2,000 years of Catholic and Christian teaching is wrong Jewish and Hebrew teaching is wrong uh, nature is wrong apparently too you know um, and, and they want as well to have the ordination of women to the diaconate always passing the lie that there was the women deacons in the early church. And I've said that before, I have a video on the women diaconate, deacons, uh, that there is no such thing. It never existed. What is called deaconesses in the early church, they were just um, usually elderly women who were maybe had a blessing, not ordained, uh, and they were responsible to visiting widows, helping young women, uh, assisting priests and bishops, in the say baptismal of women especially adult women when they were baptized naked and they were dipped into the water so the the, the man the bishop didn't want to be touching a woman especially when the anointing so the anointing of her naked body so they were helping the bishop out in this respect this is a this is a thing which uh, is not needed anymore obviously um, and uh, the council of nicaea in 325 there's a canon in there, which is, I quoted in the video. I actually, I put it in the, in, written in the description of the video, because I didn't, I think, put it in the actual video. I can't recall now. But anyways, canon in Council of Nicaea 325, he talk, they talk about so-called deaconesses. Specifically, it says that these women, uh, hands are not imposed upon them, meaning they are not ordained. And that... That's the Council of Nicaea in 325. Specifically says, these women are in all respects to be considered among the laity. So they are not clerics in any term. Even the lowest level of cleric, like, you know, a porter or a, or a lector or a, nothing. They are not even in that. Actually, in the deaconesses, they acted the part of, they performed some of the functions of a porter, one of the lower degrees of the church, in the court of the women, on the side of the women, because the men would sit on one side of the church, or stand, or kneel, on one side of the church, women on the other. So the deaconesses were responsible for the women's side. You know, arrange where the virgins say, sit, the widows sit. There was arrangement. There's not a mishmash, uh, anything goes thing. So these are the functions of the deaconesses, but now that is being pushed by the German bishops. And, you know, Pope Francis, he had two rejections of women deacons and two commissions. Now he instituted a third commission because he, he wants his yes. And as soon as he gets his yes, when he stacks the, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the commission, he can go ahead and do whatever he wants. And actually, he just did the uh, so-called uh, uh, imposing the ministry on men and women of a catechist and, um, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's just another invention, a fabrication, an innovation, a, 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 um, a perverse novelty, as St. Vincent of Lawrence would say. Anyways, so it starts with chapter one, the next pope. See, I have to, I cannot stop myself from talking sometimes. 
So it starts off with uh, Car- with uh, Rot- uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Um, I think this is before he, uh, the papal election, which elected him uh, after John Paul II died. So today, having a clear, f- so that's what Cardinal Ratzinger says, and that's exactly what is condemned by. Uh, Well, let's read the quote. Today, having a clear faith based on the creed of the church is often labeled as fundamentalism or as Jorge Francis of Rome would say, rigidity and doctrinal uh, uh, rigidity, you know, uh, whereas relativism, that is letting oneself to be, quoting St. Paul here, Ratzinger says, tossed here and there, carried about by every wind of doctrine, seems the only attitude that can cope with the modern times. We are building a dictatorship of relativism that does not recognize anything as definitive and whose ultimate goal consists solely of one's own ego and desires. And that is the dictator of relativism, dictatorship of relativism, which is being pushed by Francis of Rome, by the German synods, by all the modernist junta, which is um, took control of the Vatican. Um, so uh, now it starts off um, some. Oh, there was a photograph called "A Visit Enjoyed by by Friends," and this photograph. There's Martini and the group of the European Cardinals, which formed the Sankt Gallen Mafia. And here's, a, she gives a few names of the, uh, here you go, down here, oh, down here. So the names were Martini, Cardinal Martini, Daniels, who revealed the Mafia, Gasper, the, uh, basically the enemy of Ratzinger for forever, uh, Murphy Murphy O'Connor and I have a book on it's called The Keys of the Kingdom I did a, a brief review of that I believe it was called The Keys of the Kingdom <clears throat> where the, how the British basically interfered in the election of Jorge and Murphy O'Connor was instrumental in getting Francis elected Selve, Sil, Silvestrini they were the key members and alumni of the Sankt Gallen Mafia. And as I said, they wanted to elect Martini as Pope. Um, so, and they, so Martini, it says here, founded the Sankt Gallen Mafia in 1996 and became their, their messiah, their standard of 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 novelty and heresy <laughs> he's the the founder of the new church they want um, and they basically what sparked them what was their 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 raison d'etre hatred of ratzinger hatred of the um German Rottweiler, which turned out to be a German puppy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I really wanted Ratzinger to come down smashing error when he got elected, but unfortunately, he actually elevated to positions of power those who hated him. He thought, well, let's make peace in the church. Let me dialogue with uh, heretics and, and uh, modernists. You know. So he says here, Martini spoke of his program for the next pope decentralization of the church now francis says oh i want synodality to decentralize the church but he is the most centralizing pope in history he wants every like uh, a traditional mass oh no no bishops he he pretends to 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 give bishops the power back which uh pope benedict said every priest of the roman right has the, the right to celebrate the roman right of tradition very simple you don't need to ask permission because you're a Roman Rite priest. You can celebrate the Roman Rite. What's the big deal? That's the way it is. But then uh, Francis says, oh, no, traditionis custodis. And his, uh, his uh, sycophants say, oh, no, 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 no. Now Francis is giving back the power to bishops. But is he? If you read the document, he's actually telling them, no, you can shut down things. Uh, you cannot authorize new masses. Um, 
any priest who wants to celebrate it, they have to actually come to Rome and get permission from Rome to celebrate the ancient liturgy. So he's not getting giving anything back to bishops. He is centralizing power in himself. Uh, so they talk about the, it's exactly like what happens with the leftists in the U.S. politics and Canadian politics. They accuse others of what they do. You know, they sow division and they call others divisive. They saw so uh, uh, confusion and they call others causing confusion. They sow hatred and they accuse others of causing hatred. Same thing. Francis says, "Oh, I want decentralization," and he centralizes. Um, I want you know, give me your uh, your 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 opinion, but hey, it cannot be Catholic, cannot be traditional, cannot be rigid. Yeah, you can have any other opinion; that's fine, but that's okay. Uh, so, uh, so Martino wanted decentralization of the church. He wanted new answers uh, that the next pope would have to give on sexuality. Who am I to judge? You know. Communion for the divorced and civilly remarried, which is basically uh, eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ um, unto damnation and judgment, as St. Paul says. Well, go ahead. You're, 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 you're living in a state of sin with no intention of, of amending your life or changing your life, but come ahead, eat and drink judgment upon yourself. I'm so merciful to you. I am Francis. Uh, according to the papers, he even spoke of a possible diaconate for women, Martini. So now Francis started with this ministries with a, installed in a liturgical manner by the bishop. And Francis actually installed in a liturgical rite, invented out of nothing, women into, into these ministries. Um, so... Yep. Uh, so uh, it gives you stories of of the different um, machinations of these uh, people in the mafia. Um, so it talks about in two thousand one when Bergoglio became cardinal and he was known as a conservative. Another deception. And, and then he went back and went to Rome and got connected to Martini again, his mentor. So chapter two is Salvestrini. So Salvestrini, so it says here a few months after Benedict's election, a mysterious conclave diary appeared and um, And, other, and people think it was Salvestrini is the author of that diary. So it talks about some of that. Um, again, some of the things which they rejected of Ratzinger saying was Christians are called to reject as, in, as injurious to democratic life a conception of pluralism that reflects moral relativism and casper just said well you know ireland approved homosexual unions well it's the democracy so we have to approve that because the democracy says that okay and now the german synod says well that's not even a sin anymore well, it's it's wrong the church's teaching of 2000 years holy scripture is wrong you know but we said we're more enlightened why because they don't actually believe that the holy scriptures are holy or the word of god they don't believe the faith. They don't believe the church teaching. They think they're just, you know, make up uh, pure modernism. It's like, you know, how I see it, how I feel about it. That's the truth. My truth, your truth, his truth, their truth. There is no truth. Um, actually, I have an excellent video. Uh, I can't remember. It says, I think Francis, Francis is Vatican. What is truth? Uh, it's like three hours long because there was an article on the Vatican website basically pushing the evolution of doctrine, not the development of doctrine, which is the same same doctrine just kind of flowering and, and becoming more mature and more deepening. 
that is the development of doctrine, but the evolution of doctrine condemned by Pope St. Pius X and every rational human being from the beginning of Christianity called depraved novelty. If all the ancient fathers called, condemned novel heresy, the doctrines of novelty, because what they do is this evolution of doctrine, he changes one thing to another. One, they change the meaning of the doctrine to another. They keep the same name, but they completely have a different meaning and understanding. And that Vatican website article basically was pushing everything. They were talking about hell and, and baptism and, and a multitude of other things. And I really spent a lot of time analyzing this and basically refuting it off of their own website, off their own, of the Catholic teaching. So I encourage you to watch that. Um, so Rossing continues, says, democracy must be based on the true and solid foundation of non-negotiable ethical principles. But that would be called a rigidity and not being, uh, you know, uh, open, uh, not, not walking together in the spirit. Um, talks about, so I'm, I'm going to just have to skip because there's, so there's Salvestrini. Number two, number, but he's the number one guy, is Martini. Martini. He was sipping his martini and calling himself Martini. Anyways. Um, so it says Martini would emerge as the spiritual heir to, to a key Vatican II revolution. A revolutionary uh, so he'd be the spiritual heir to the key Vatican II revolutionary father, Karl Rahner, who is suspected of heterodoxy by Pius XII. Uh, and actually talks about Ratzinger, who became Benedict XVI, who were actually instrumental as an assistant of Rahner, because Ratzinger was one of the liberal periti, periti which is the experts of the council, and they used to overthrow the original documents of Vatican II, which were prepared. They were all thrown in the garbage and brand new fabricated documents like the fabricated liturgy after Vatican II came into being. They took the old prepared documents of John the 23rd to be voted upon. They threw them all in the garbage except that on the liturgy because it was so vague and could be had a lot of time bombs in it which they liked and everything else was thrown in the garbage and they invented new ones and basically forced the vote. Um, and he worked for Cardinal Fringes, uh, Ratzinger, and um, Fringes later, uh, later in the, the council hall, Fringes, 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 I don't know how you pronounce his name, uh, helped lead uh, a first insurrec ins insurrection, that's a real insurrection, against the event's electoral procedures. So one of the progressive cardinals yelled out, happy coup and daring violation of the rules. Revolutionaries. That's who's ruling the church now. Um, okay, I'm just going to kind of skip here. Bye. Yeah, talks about Martini wanting a synod, synodal church, which is basically Francis is the puppet. He is, as he himself said in that interview, um, I believe when he, he left the, the hospital office after his operation or a, a slightly later interview, he says, I am just doing what, I, what the cardinals want me to do when they elected me. And who are the cardinals who got him elected? The St. Colin group and their um, supporters. All right. So then chapter four goes Casper. Or the, the, the the friendly ghost, Casper, the friendly ghost. And, uh, and it talks about, I mean, their real contention was with Ratzinger. Uh, oh, this is Rahner. In 1967, Rahner helped the German bishops draft a, uh, a letter declaring that, in quotes here, the church can be subject to error and has in fact erred. That's why they're talking now, the German Synod, and this Cardinal, I just like two or three days ago, he was saying, the church is teaching about homosexuality is false. So the church erred. So the 
church is wrong for 2,000 years. The Holy Scriptures are wrong. God is wrong. See, Paul is wrong. The apostles are wrong. Okay. The fathers are wrong. But they are right. Um, and in 1972, the shape of the church to come, Rahner dreamed of the future church would look like what it, what it would look like. He was dreaming of uh, of a new church centered on surrender to the world. And now, especially since this uh, last two years, we have seen how much the church has surrendered to the world and to the rulers of the world and to the big business of the world. That you can't even go into the Vatican now until you've got three things into your arm so you're fully <sighs> you know what um, so synodality civil civil marriage so again it goes through different characters different uh, machinations which were happening So it says in the mid 90s, Casper walked into the ranks of the mafia. Then, chapter 5, Daniels. He is the one who actually revealed the mafia. And uh, and he and Martini were close friends since 1983. The Antipope. The Antipope is Martini, chapter 6. I'm just kind of skipping quick here. But as I said, it's really not a very long book. Uh, worth the price, good read, lots of characters. You can see what's going on. And tons of uh, references if you want to spend the time to check them out. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, there's a, it says, and this was reported by Sandro Magister, and it is in a, so after a year of Bene, Pope Benedict's election, a bombshell interview on bioethics from Martini. Um, so Martini was basically being hailed as the next Pope in 1995. So had only hinted at changes to the church now, in, after a year of Benedict's election, so probably 2006 then. So Martini says he embraced the notion of a moral gray, of moral gray areas in an interview that some, some claim to be like, the, like a manifesto of an anti-pope. Well, that manifesto is being <laughs> fulfilled nowadays. Um, All right, let's kind of skip ahead here. So, same thing about celibacy, women deacons. Back in 1999, a serious group called the Millenari uh, had said something relevant to this question of listening. Actually, I have the book by the Millenari. And I, did I do a review on it? I think I did and I deleted it because I haven't read it in so long. It was kind of a crappy review. But it was from 1999 and they were revealing the the um, the uh, uh, the Lavender Mafia in the Vatican. The uh, Those who push unnatural things in the Vatican. From 1999. Uh, I should... Yeah, here she quotes it in uh, footnote 8, which I do have that book. It's called The Shroud of Secrecy, The Story of Corruption Within the Vatican. I should actually do reread that book and do a review on it. Um, so this is not a new thing. So this underground, this, um, what they, did they call it to Ratzinger, the, uh, um, did they say the hom homosexual network or the, 
the gay something. I can't remember what they called it. But anyways, there was this group of people. I mean, <laughs> over the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, Cardinal Coco Palmari, Coco Palmarino, whatever it's called. <laughs> he and one of his priests, he was just there watching, and one of his priests, drugged out of his mind, was engaged in a in total perversion <laughs> with other men. Uh, all right, so uh, so it was not a new thing. So so we have to be careful. Uh, no country for old men, chapter eight. Two months later, Martini sent a letter to Pope Benedict. Martini feared that a hard line on doctrine would distance the church from listening. <laughs> listening. Listening meaning to do what they want to do. They pretend to listen and then impose, like what happened with Amoris Letizia, with a lot of other things. They go through the charade, the charade, the scam of listening, but they do what they want to do. Like uh, Francis Jorge's uh, 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 anti Sumorum Pontificum a piece of junk, uh, garbage uh, um, um, a letter, Traditionis Custodis, where he attempts to restrict the, the real Roman rite, the ancient liturgy. Um, he says, Well, you know, we sent all these letters to all the bishops of the world and they give us their impressions. And most bishops, they, people ask them, Did you get a letter? No. Did you get a letter? No. And the few bishops which actually got the letter, there are reports that most of them were actually satisfied with how things were going with the traditional order, communities and orders and churches. Everything was going fine for the most part. There were a few, in Italian, some Italian bishops and some French bishops were, uh, were not happy. But that's it. And then they used the scam of the letters and ignoring the, actually the vast majority which seemed to be happy with how the, the way things are, the peace in the church now. And they use the scam to try to demolish the ancient rite. Why? And I have a video on this because it's not about Latin. It's not about facing east. It is. Uh, it's called. I think uh, the, the uh, Pope Francis hates the mass because um, because of because of the faith or something to that effect. The, the the way I wrote it. But anyways, it's basically you see Pope Francis and others and his his supporters and the journalists. Talking about this, this, the ancient liturgy is a new, different ecclesiology. It is incompatible with the with the ecclesiology and doctrine of Vatican II. So, if you say that, basically, you're telling people that post-Vatican II ecclesiology and orientation is anti-Catholic because for two thousand years that's how things were. So, so you get to choose: do I choose uh, novelty or tradition? All right. Um, oh, so this is in the, the dark horse. It talks about the the fifth vote was annulled because there was one ballot too many. That was actually one of the things about um, what's his name, um, the Italian author uh, Antonio Sochi, which he wrote a book about it. Um, that he says, well, this extra vote which was not allowed by council rules uh, renders the election of Francis null because it violated the rules it allowed only I think for four and they did five um, anyways I actually did go through this much more detail uh, in my review of the book uh, the election of Francis I think and because they do mention that and um, if you're interested you can actually spend some time looking at that um, Chapter 10, The Ghost of Cardinal Martini. The Ghost of Cardinal Martini. Uh, it followed him, uh, if it followed him as he got dressed before making his first appearance as Pope uh, at St. Peter's Loggia. No, thank you. He had said, as the dressing assistant offered him the crimson mosetta of the popes, because he's just a bishop of Rome. 
Then he refused to exchange his black shoes for red ones, color of the martyr's blood. When he came out all dressed in white, wearing his own cross and silver ring instead of the gold pectoral cross of a pope. And, uh, and, and then they quote uh, Francis as saying at the beginning when, on his election, when he got up on the, on the balcony there, and it says, uh, the, tick, the ticking kept pursuing the Pope with, with, a round of, with round glasses as he said, brothers and sisters, Buena sera, buena sera. And everybody cheered like idiots, and our hearts. <coughs> Uh, he was casual, a little shy, you know, and then he says, and that's Francis was saying this, you know, that the duty of the conclave was to provide Rome with a bishop, he said. It was, uh, it was the first of many times that he would call himself not Pope, but Bishop of Rome. And that lasted a long time. So actually, it continues what Francis says, the diocesan community, the diocesan community of Rome now has its bishop. So he is the Bishop of Rome. And I guess Benedict is the Vicar of Christ. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, yeah, for a long, long, long time. He refused to be called Pope. Nowadays, he starts to say, oh, I'm the Pope. you got to follow me because I said so. Mm. And of course, he says he eschewed the papal palace because, you know, Jorge is not living in the papal palace because the papal palace is for the popes. He's living at a hotel, the Hotel Santa Marta. So he took over a hotel. He's living in the hotel room uh, and not living where the popes normally live. You know, figure it out. Um, and he created the Council of Cardinals, and of course, when uh, what's his name, the Australian Cardinal, was getting too tough, you know, they invented something for him and got, uh, got him to go to prison in Australia until he was vindicated. Yeah. Uh, Four years later, in 2009, Martini sat with atheist Eugenio Scalfari, and this atheist journalist is the bestest of friends with Francis. And they had so many interviews, and I have a whole video on, I believe, as many of the interviews I could find of Francis and Eugenio Scalfari. And the outrageous things Scalfari says Francis told him such as uh, souls disappear, they don't uh, suffer eternal damnation, only the saved you know, will, will, will go to heaven, but there is no hell really because these souls, souls will be annihilated. Uh, he said, uh, uh, there's only really one God, there's no such thing as Christian God. God is God, you know, it's like uh, uh, whether you, you, there's this unique God, you know, all religions basically worship that God. And he basically said as well, one of the most outrageous things, if true and never denied, that he didn't really, he left, he says like, you know, Jesus actually left his divinity in heaven. So when he was on earth, he was just man, he was just a human being. And he gained his divinity uh, after the resurrection. Or, uh, or at the ascension, I can't remember which, which, which is which. But this video with Eugenio Scalfari, you can watch it, it's unbelievable, and was never denied. Every time the Vatican would say, well, well, this is not exactly the exact words Pope Francis actually said. They never said that's false, this is wrong. He never said that. He actually believes this and this and that, that's Catholic doctrine. No, it's just like, he didn't really exactly say that. You know, these are not exact quotations. And if they were so wrong, why would Francis keep on interviewing Scalfari? He would actually phone him up and chat on the phone. All right. So in 2009, Martini met with atheist Eugenio Scalfari. Uh, first, Martini promised that he was not there to proselytize his atheist interviewer. And that is exactly what Francis says to Eugenio Scalfari, the same guy. 
Eugenio Scalfrey says, you know, Francis told me, I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to, go, to proselytize you. The exact same thing which Martini did. So he's exactly, he's the, he's the basically in Martini incarnate. <laughs> Uh, but apparently Martini was pretty smart. Uh, Jorge, uh, well, whatever. So anyways, so it's exact words which Martini is. And actually, I have an excellent video again. I, I say excellent about my own videos because I think they're excellent. It is um, it is called uh, Francis uh, Evangelization versus Proselytism. Evangelization versus Proselytism. Because in this, is is basically, it's a, a big... Um, interview or a lecture he gave to Jesuits from Africa and he is contrasting evangelism from proselytism and basically what it is is evangelism is basically being a nice person a good person helping people out proselytism is actually to trying to convert people to the true faith defending the faith giving logical arguments in favor of the truth that is proselytism so basically, true Christianity, true evangelization is a proselytism for Francis and for Martini. Um, so, oh, here's another quote here. Um, then Francis smiled and said, okay, again, he, uh, she's talking about the, the interview with, with uh, Eugenio Scalfari. It's a joke, Scalfari replied, answering that, uh, his own friend said it was the Pope who wanted to convert him. Then Francis smiled again and said, proselytism is solemn nonsense. Proselytism is solemn nonsense. And that's exactly basically what he says to the Jesuits of, was it Mozambique or one of the African countries. Watch my video, proselytism versus evangelization. So shows you Eugenius Scalfrey wasn't making stuff up. He actually said that to the Jesuits, openly published on the Vatican website. Chapter 11, God of Surprises. God is not a God of surprises. God is unchangeable. God is of truth. Um, and these days, oh, this is again, so when he got elected, First, his first Angelus address. In these days, I have been able to read a book by a cardinal, a Cardinal Casper. You see his inspiration, Martini Casper. Talented theologian. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI would think uh, kind of a dangerous theologian because of the errors he promotes. A good theologian on mercy. See, Francis talks a lot about mercy, and he's been the most unmerciful of popes. He talks mercy, and he first, as soon as he got elected, he basically crushed the Franciscan friars of the Immaculate. And any on, from the first years, he started crushing traditional orders, traditional priests, traditional bishops. The merciful one. And then Francis continues in his first angels, Holy Father, you should not recommend that book. There are many heresies in it. An older, an older cardinal later said, smiling, Francis said to Casper, smiling, Francis said to Casper. So Francis was laughing that, hey, some cardinals were saying, hey, this book is full of heresies. And he was just joking, hey, he's telling Casper. And he, was, he told Casper, it goes in one ear and out the other. Eh, heresy, heresy, who cares? So that's what happened with the dubia of the cardinals sent it to by to Cardinal uh, Burke, uh, Braunmuller, um, and two more. Sent a uh, dubia asking questions, uh, yes or no answers to Francis about the uh, the document on Amoris Laetitia. Is this true or not? Is this true or not? This you wouldn't answer because if he answered the wrong answer, that would be heretical, and he says, well, yeah, ignore it, <laughs> ignore it. Heresy, Pharisee, who cares? We're the new church of the new millennium and the new springtime. And just four days after into Francis's pontifical pontificate, Casper was back. Um,
Casper argued that the Pope chiefly, that the Pope is chiefly the Bishop of Rome. Eminent, yes, but one bishop among many. That's why Francis kept calling himself the Bishop of Rome. And you see the, the humiliation of Francis. He, he basically bows down and tries to receive the blessing of the Patriarch of Constantinople, which is not a, if, if it's a brother bishop, but you're, you're humiliating yourself. You are the superior. And you see Francis bow, going down on his knee, kissing the feet of the uh, Sudanese delegates and getting down on his knees, washing the feet of, of, uh, of Muslims and, and uh, um, people who are disgusting, do disgusting things, uh, especially in the early years. He bends down and does the washing of the feet. The washing of the feet meant for, is, is actually traditionally, is only not even for regular people. The washing of the feet in the Orthodox uh, churches and in uh, the uh, ancient Roman rite, the bishop actually washed the feet of his priests. Why? Because it is actually uh, an ordination ceremony of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ washed the bishop of his, washed the feet of his future priests, his bishops, Peter and the apostles. He didn't go around washing the feet of women and kids and 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 uh, sick people and and the homeless. No, he washed the feet only once of the apostles. Why? Because if you look at the Old Testament, the ordination rites to the priesthood. The washing of the feet and the hands was required for the ordination of Aaron and his sons. That's why Christ washed the feet of the apostles. It was an ordination rite. And that's why only normally the bishop would actually wash the feet. Bishop of the dice would wash the feet of 12 of his priests. Even in the, if you watch a Byzantine liturgy, I saw that I think the patriarch of, uh, of Moscow, Moscow would do that. The priests. Um, so now we've seen actually, you know, Pope Francis basically, well, yeah, you're divorced, you're remarried, you had, yeah, whatever, go ahead and have, have commu receive communion. And there's an incident of the of this woman who, who he called from, uh, to our, in Argentina. And nobody denied it. And then the Argentine bishop said, yeah, that's the interpretation. Yeah, whatever. And Francis said, yeah, that's the correct interpretation of the document. So basically, eat and drink judgment upon yourself. That is the merciful way. Um, at the end, uh, now it talks about the, the synod on the family again. It's page 125 here. We're almost over, almost done. Uh, at the end of the 2014 Synod, the final document, three paragraphs on the Casper proposal and homosexuality all failed to gain two-thirds majority, despite being toned down overall. These rejected paragraphs, according to protocols, should have been expunged from the final document. But Francis, the true revolutionary had a surprise up his sleeve. It's a god of surprises. Apparently, he is the god of surprises. Breaking synod rules. Oh, where is the synodality? Where is the listening? Um, where is the decentralization? The Pope said that the rejected paragraphs were to remain part of the final document. Unilaterally. Pope Francis himself ensured that the Casper proposal would remain on the agenda of the Ordinary Synod of 2015, despite being rejected by the fathers of the Extraordinary Synod. Yeah, that's the merciful one who likes listening, listening. More and more, the Sankt Gallen agenda was no longer hiding in the shadows. Chapter 12, Man Behind the Curtain. Talks about the Niels again. Quotes Cardinal the Niels. Here's what he says. But in reality, we said of ourselves, we said of ourselves, and, and of that group, that group, 
the, the mafia, he said. So they called themselves the mafia. So the mafia met at St. Gallen in Switzerland. And the mafia were anti-Ratzinger. The mafia got us Jorge elected. The election of Bergoglio was prepared in St. Gallen, without doubt, claimed another biographer of the Niels. Um, let's see, let's skip and skip and skip. Again, it's a really good book. So chapter 13, Chekhov's gun. Um, Oh, talking about again, so the Amor Satizia, as Pope Francis put it, yet conscience can do more than recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demands of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty uh, what for now is the most uh, generous response, which can be given to God and come to see with a certain moral security that it is what God himself is asking among the concrete complexities of one's limits, while yet not fully objective ideal. So basically, even though something objectively is against the will of God, against the commandments, but you know, your such situation is kind of tough, so you're still, you know, the best thing is just to continue in that sin or that uh, situation. God understands, and actually, this is probably the will of God that you defy His own will. <laughs> okay. Um, talks about the dubia again. Francis's old 2013 interview with Eugenius Scalfrey spoke up Your Holiness, is there a single vision of the good? And who decides what it is? Scalfrey asked. Each of us has a vision of good and evil. We have to encourage people to move towards what they think is good. So there is no objective good. Now, what do you think is good? You think it's good? You think this lifestyle is good? Okay. Who am I to judge? You think, uh, you know... And Francis continues, Everyone has his own idea of good and evil and must choose to follow the good and the evil as he perceives them. As he perceives them. So if you have a seared conscience, if you have uh, uh, blinders on your eyes and you don't see them, follow that which is objectively evil because you think it's good. Yeah, talks about Fran again, Scalfrey, basically Francis abolishing hell. Um, and actually, this story about Francis abolishing hell because he said basically, you know, yeah, there's no real. Hell. He didn't say there is no hell. He said oh, the souls of sinners are basically extinguished, disappear. And and here's what Martini had said, his mentor, really. I hope that sooner or later. God redeems everyone. And actually, I think Francis said, God will save everyone. <laughs> That's basically what he says. I am a great optimist, said Martini, in Night Conversations. That's the book. Uh, but regarding sinners such as Hitler, Martini thought it was easier to think that, in quotation mark, such people are simply extinguished. Simply extinguished is exactly what Francis said. Um, all right, chapter 14, things fall apart. Things fall apart. All right, we're almost done. I want to, oh, almost an hour, so hopefully we'll be done pretty soon. Oh, so it says here, then in 2016, Pope Francis set up a commission to study the possibility of installing female diaconates, which rejected it. And there was a commission before it, which rejected it. Now, I think after the Amazonian Synod said, well, let's another, do a third commission <laughs> because they want to do the impossible, invent 
diaconates for women. Like he invented this ministry, which is in, uh, for women and men, and installed in a liturgical rite by a bishop into a ministry, which doesn't exist. Invented. As I quoted, uh, didn't quote it, but I'm just letting you know, in, ca in a canon of, uh, of the Council of Nicaea in 325, specifically it says, the so-called deaconesses, uh, they were never ordained, and no hands were placed upon them, and they are all respect to be considered among the laity. That's in 325. So don't tell me, well, the early church in the 10th and 11th centuries had the deaconesses. Well, what do you mean by deaconesses? Completely different than a, a male deacon, not a cleric, not serving in the liturgy, period. Uh, this diaconate for women, says Daniel's, uh, says Daniel's biography, represents a crucial step towards greater openness to women's ordination. So, talks a bit about the Amazon Synod and the final document. And actually, you should watch my video on the Amazon, it's like uh, the, the, the paganiz paganization of the church, uh, the Amazon Synod's final document or something like that. I wrote, a, I basically went through the whole document. And actually, what was, people said, oh, oh Francis issued his uh, second, um, his, his um, presentation of the document afterwards, a summary or presentation. And he didn't mention the priestly celibacy. He didn't mention female diaconates. Oh, thank God. But actually, Francis in the same, and I think it, she says that here somewhere in the book, uh, in the same document, his document, he says, I fully endorse the final document. Go read it. I'm not going to go over it again. Go read the final document. So basically, in his summary, he endorses fully the final document. And exactly what's been predicted in the final document is being done. The institution of invented out of thin air ministries for women, installed in a liturgical rite by the bishop, uh, and the openness to... Uh, uh, so that's basic, that was done. That's based on the original... Uh, Amazonian document, and I think several other things which have been fulfilled based upon the Amazon, and they want to talk an Amazonian rite, so no traditional Roman rite, but let's invent something, paganization, call it the Amazonian rite. That would be coming pretty soon. Um, anyways, uh, and now they're pushing for diaconates for women. Um, all right. All right, so. All right, okay, we're almost done here. Patience, chapter 15. Patience. Patience. So it talks about basically, as I recall, um, it's talking about like, yeah, you want to go slow. You want to you wanna have patience because you don't want to cause a schism. They want to take the church and transform it into a new church. As Francis said that two, three days ago. Says, My vision of a new church uh, is, I can't remember openness and whatever he said so yeah they don't want to split the church which they are in fact are doing but they want to take this church without pushing going too fast too hard and cause it an immediate split doing it slowly by increments to have the new church they want which is not the church of christ oh here's actually what i was just saying querida amazonia which is the document of Francis after the Amazonian Synod's final document, is very clever, says Cardinal Oswald Gracias, one of the advisors in Francis's Council of Cardinals. In the text says Gracias, which I noticed right away, actually, in, what, three years ago, whenever that was, Francis is endorsing the final document. Francis is endorsing the final document of the Amazonian citizen, which itself endorses the ordination of married men and further study of the female diaconates. And actually, as I said, he instituted a third commission to study the female diaconate, even though Council of Nicaea in 325 says so-called deaconesses have never ever been ordained. They are in all respects to be considered among the laity. But hey, two no's is not enough. They need their yes. And then they say, well, we studied it, we studied it, we, were, we did the listening, we're open to the spirit, to the, to the spirit of the signs of the times, and we're going to do whatever we want to do. Um, uh, 
In 2019, during his Christmas address to the Curia, Pope Francis urged, urged courage in changing the church. Cardinal Martini, in his last interview, a few days before his death, said something, that's what's, what Francis is saying, said something that should make us think, said Pope Francis. Then he quoted at full strength some startling words of Martini. Now, Francis is quoting Martini, his mentor. The church is 200 years behind the times. Why is she not shaken up? Are we afraid? Fear instead, fear instead of courage. So that's what Francis said, quoting Martini the heretic. Time, chapter 16. Uh, Time. In June 12, 2012, two months after his mysterious meeting in Switzerland, Martini met Benedict for the last time at the World Meeting of Families in Milan. And then Martini is telling Benedict, the Curia is not going to change. You have no choice but to leave. He's telling the Pope to leave. The time for resignation is now. Nothing can be done here anymore. And then a year later, Benedict um, uh, renounces the active exercise of the ministry, but his, resi his uh, renunciation of the active exercise doesn't, um, doesn't revoke his, his acceptance of the office in 2005, something which would have been utterly impossible for him to do, as, as Gonsolin says, and that he never abandoned the office of Peter. But somehow he renounced, so he still dressed as, in his papal garb, he still kept his papal name, he still stays at the Vatican, he still gives the apostolic blessing, and he's still called Pope, he's still called Holiness. And the cardinals, every time Francis chooses a bunch, brings them to see and receive the blessing of Pope Benedict. Mystery of mysteries. So this is a brief review of the Sanct Gallen, Saint Gallen Mafia, by uh, Julia Maloney. Uh, a really excellent read, uh, very good, well-written, very intriguing, gives you the different characters, uh, not very you know, in depth with one character or with one theme, but it's just kind of like a snapshot of this and this character, Salvestrini, Mill, um, Scalfari, uh, Martini, Casper, um, Murphy O'Connor, and so forth, Daniels. So you get a little picture of what's going on. And um, I think she ends it by, she would, how did, she ends it pretty well. Um, Anyways, um, yeah, I can't remember. She had a really good saying at the close of the end. But as I said, all of it is really well written, really nicely written, nice hard bound, hard bound book. So this is the uh, dust jacket on it. Um, and there's a lot of uh, endorsements. Uh, Dr. Janet Smith, moral theologian. Uh, Dr. Mikey Hickson, uh, journalist for LifeSite News. Matt Gaspers of Catholic Family News. Timothy Flanders of uh, 1 Peter 5. Of course, um, um, Timothy Gordon and others. Really nice. Again, she doesn't bring anything off her from her own uh, mind. It's all... Uh, all documented. You can double check, triple check, quadruple check. Um, very intriguing, very makes you think. Like, uh, you know, it's kind of this is uh, an infiltration, a, a, a getting a pope who will do what those who love the world 
want to do, not those who love Christ. So, anyways, this is the Rio Sancte Saint Golden Mafia by Julia Maloney. Go grab it uh, directly from Ten, from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever. All right, I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, that's it, that's all. And um, subscribe to the channel. Give me a triple, quadruple thumbs up. Share the video, pass the word, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.